I do hope you have your Bibles. <clears throat> if you do, First Thessalonians chapter 1, begin with the fourth verse. Now, as we read this verse, there's going to be one word in here that I want to just warn you, one word that's a little bit controversial in some Christian circles. People want to argue and fight and debate over it. And actually, if we stop and focus on that one word, we're going to miss Paul's point. I'm going to deal with it briefly, but I want to suggest to you the word that I'm talking about here really was not part of Paul's major argument. And so I, I bet you can find it when we read it. Again, one word that's been a source of tension. But anyway, having said that, let's see if you can't find it. Here's uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. You probably got it already. That he's chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, in full conviction. You know what kind of men... We proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Paul's writing to the Thessalonians and thanking them for their faith. He says, I've heard about you and I realize, well, I realize what Christ has done in you. And I've heard reports about you. In fact, those reports are echoing forth everywhere. And as I read this passage, you want to stop and say, I hope this is true of me. I hope this is true of our, our church, that we have a reputation for godliness and for kindness and compassion, and that the gospel message echoes forth from us. And it's interesting, this passage really gives us a good view of discipleship. And so as we go through this passage, I want you to notice how the gospel goes forward and what kind of response the gospel is supposed to have. But before uh, really diving into that, I, I do want to talk about this one little word, this word chosen. It's the word elected. Some people use it to, to talk about predestination or uh, election. And again, few issues can, well, few issues are more controversial or cause more arguments among Christians. And let me just stop and say it is difficult to harmonize a view of God's sovereignty, God being in control of everything, and man's responsibility. So people on both sides of the issue, they argue for those things. And I've just got to stop and say simply, both are true scripturally. You need to realize that God is sovereign, and yet God has given man responsibility. Both of those are true in Scripture. And so whatever your view of election is, I've got to stop and say, let's not argue about that. That's not his point. Whatever your view of election is, you need to at least acknowledge a couple things. And one we find in this passage. First thing you need to acknowledge, again, whatever your view is, whatever election is or your chosenness is, it is based in God's love. I want you to notice the phrase. He says, for we know brothers loved by God that he has chosen you. It's interesting because that phrase, brothers, you see it there, loved by God, it's used 19 times in this short little book. In fact, it's used more times here than anywhere else in Scripture. His point is simply, do you know who you are? God loves you. Uh, you are called part of his family. And I don't want you to miss the importance. In fact, people would argue about this word. They do so without understanding the context of this word. This word chosen. Understand in the first century, if you were in a Greek culture or, or in a, a Roman culture, they use this word chosen or elected a lot. People were chosen, they were elected, they were appointed, they were appointed based on, well, their own abilities, their own background, their own family pedigree. People were chosen because of what they had done with their life, and so people were selected or elected based on the, their merits, on their character, on, on, well, how talented they were. The ones who were chosen were deemed worthy based on their personal attributes, and you need to understand that in context here, in God's community... In God's community of faith, we're chosen not on our own merit. How are we chosen? We're chosen on the love of God. We realize that it's nothing we've done. We can't be deemed worthy. It's not something because we're so great or we're so special that God has somehow chosen us. It's based in God's love. He loves us so much that even when we're unworthy, he chose us. He loved us so much that even while we're sinners, he sent his son to die for us. And so understand this phrase. It's really important. It's in direct contrast to the culture in which they lived. Don't you realize that you are loved by God? Beloved, you are, you are God's loved ones. And you need to understand, whatever your view of election is, understand it's based in the love of God. I also have to take it one step farther and kind of show you what we're chosen for. To do that, uh, we need to realize that, that we are chosen for the purpose of being conformed to the image of Christ. Let me take you to somewhere else with Paul. He says, 
in Romans, those who he foreknew, he also predestined. For what purpose? That's the question. For what purpose? To be conformed to the image of his son. See, God loves people. God has chosen you, and he wants to conform you to his son, Jesus Christ. He wants to mold you and shape you and equip you to be everything you're supposed to be. And Paul's point, actually, here is not to argue theology. Paul is writing to give them, well, he's writing to give them encouragement. He's writing to give them strength and assurance. You, I know you're going through tough times. I know you live in a world that's harsh. I know people are persecuting you, but do you realize who you are? You're God's loved ones. God has chosen you, and here's what he wants to do. He wants to mold you and shape you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And so you need to realize that Paul's purpose is not to fuel theological controversy. It is to provide assurance and comfort. And so he simply acknowledges who they are and says, I know you're God's loved ones. I know that he has a purpose for you because I've seen it being lived out in your own lives. Just back up a few verses, we realize he's already thanked them for their working faith and their laboring love and their enduring hope. And now he's going to thank them. I know that you have received the gospel message and you are now declarers of the gospel message. And so I know who you are. You're God's chosen. I know who you are. You're ones who God loves and you're being shaped into his image. And with that being said, I just want to move on and say Paul's purpose is not to really define what that means for us, but he is going to tell us how the gospel message goes forward. In fact, in this passage, we're going to find three stages of the progression of the gospel and what it really looks like to become a disciple of Christ. And so I just want to walk down through this passage. In fact, I'm going to take verse by verse and kind of phrase by phrase. And the first thing he does, he actually talks about the preaching of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And we read, as we look at verse 5, he says, our gospel came to you. And I want to stop and say, okay, how did it come? I like asking questions. He says, our gospel came to you. Well, how did it come? He goes on to explain. Our gospel came to you not only in words, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Our gospel came to you, and let me just take each of those one by one. He says, our gospel came not only in words, but I've got to say, it didn't only come in words, but it did come in words, didn't it? We remember that Paul and Silas and Timothy on their second missionary journey, they came to Thessalonica and they preached the gospel message. And here's what's amazing to me about that. The God's redemptive story, the fact that God loved us so much that he sent his son, the fact that Jesus loved us so much that he came to earth, for some reason, God has given that great story and that great message for us to communicate. And if we don't communicate it, who's going to communicate it? And for some reason, I don't understand this mystery, why would God put this great story, the gospel message, into our charge? Why would he give that us? Because if we don't take it forward, it's not going to be taken forward. In fact, Paul's going to write elsewhere that we really are his ambassadors. Notice 2 Corinthians. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Understand the great responsibility God has given us. We are responsible to tell other people about him. And so our message, it doesn't just come in words, but it comes in words. We need to be willing to tell the message of Jesus Christ to other people. And Paul just reminds me, it didn't come only in words, but we did bring the gospel message to you. We are Christ's ambassadors. And so we need to understand that it's through sharing the gospel. In fact, Paul's going to say elsewhere, Romans chapter 10, how then will they call on him whom they've not believed? And how will they believe in him of whom they've not never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? God has given us the message of reconciliation. We are his ambassadors. We're to take the gospel message forward. And if we don't do it, who will? And so Paul says, I just want to remind you, it didn't come only in words, but it did come in, in words. Paul and Silas and Timothy brought the message. But I want to suggest to you that their message would have been empty. If they were just speaking words and their lifestyle didn't match those words, it would have been useless. And I want you to notice what Paul says as we go back to our passage he tells us, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Paul's going to go on and say, you know we worked hard. We labored and toiled. We know, you know that we suffered for the gospel. He's going to tell a story about how he was chased out of Philippi. They suffered great for, for the gospel. And here's what I want to point out to you. Paul's message was effective not only because he came speaking the word, but his lifestyle matched his words. And oh, for preachers of the gospel who would stand up and not only speak the gospel message, but people who they're well, their lives reflected the message they spoke. And oh, for Christians who would live out their faith. You see, the, the, the church has this bad reputation. All oh, those people are a bunch of hypocrites. And there are a bunch of people who they say one thing and they li live a life that's quite different. You know that to be true, don't you? In fact, I've been one of those people. You have too. At time to time, we're hypocrites. But notice what Paul's saying. 
The gospel came to you in words, and by the way, you know what kind of men we were among you. You can believe our story because you saw it lived out in our lives. Their lives matched their words. Their, their message took on feet. And I want to suggest to you, if you want the gospel message to go forward, that's what kind of people we need to be. We need to walk the talk. And oh, for Christians who would live out their faith daily. So their, their gospel came not only in words, but it did come in words. And the words they spoke were, were aligned with their character. But he goes on and says, not only did it come in words, it came not only in words, but it also came in power. And this one is just so, it's so amazing to me. There's something about the preaching of the gospel message that has power. God can even use flawed men and even people who don't speak eloquently, and his message still goes forward. Let me just, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. There's sometimes when I go out and I think, boy, that message bombed. And you can say, yeah, we thought that way too. (laughs) And yet there's other people who say, you know, that sermon touched me today. There's something about the word of God spoken that's powerful. Let me say that just a, a little bit different. There's something about the message of God. The word of God faithfully proclaimed, I believe, is one of the most powerful things in the world. The word of God faithfully proclaimed, I'm going to say it stronger. What's stronger than the word of God faithfully proclaimed? The word of God faithfully proclaimed is the most powerful force in the word. Somehow God takes teaching and preaching, powerful preaching, preaching that's faithful to his word. Somehow God uses that to change lives, the spoken word of God. Somehow God uses that to heal relationships, and God uses his word faithfully preached to build up and to strengthen, to do his work on earth. There's something about the word of God faithfully proclaimed that's powerful, and Paul, Paul, Paul even says that, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The message of God, it's powerful when it's preached. The message of God is powerful when it's shared. And I'm gonna tell you, it's not about your eloquence, it's about your faithfulness to God's word. And as you speak God's word to other people, it has power. It's amazing how powerful God's word is. And why does God use that? I don't know exactly how, but we realize that the word of God is powerful. In fact, Paul says that elsewhere, 1 Corinthians. He says this in chapter two. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The word of God shared The word of God spoken, it is powerful and it changes things. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter four, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing, even the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow and discernment for the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God changes things. The word of God has power. And I wanna tell you, you don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to have all the answers. What you need to do is just be faithful and share what God has done for you, or share scripture with people, and there's something about that that God uses for his glory. And so we also should not be ashamed of the gospel message. We should be willing to share the gospel message, even when we don't think we know how to communicate it. Just speak God's word. It has power. So they say, our words not only came in in words, but it came in power. I'm gonna switch the order on, on purpose. I'm gonna look at another phrase out of order. It came with full conviction. Interesting word. This word, full conviction, a settled and passionate conviction of of truth. Literally, this word means with no uncertainty. Paul says, we came and shared the gospel with you. It was not only in words, but it was in power, and we did so with full conviction. I want to stop and say, well, that's great for the Apostle Paul. He's the Apostle Paul. Certainly, he knows what he's talking about. He could do it with full conviction. I've got to stop and say, actually, that's not what is going on here. Full conviction does not mean that we have to have all the answers, It doesn't even mean that you yourself won't have questions from time to time. You don't have to be a know-it-all. You don't have to have every answer to every possible question and be able to, to really answer every objection that somebody else brings up. You just need to have a surety, confidence in Jesus Christ and his word. Do you believe Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God? Do you believe that the Bible is the word of God? Well, then you can share that with full conviction. Here's what the Bible says. I don't have all the answers, but I do know this one thing. The word of God tells me this, and I believe the word of God. And so it does not mean that we will never have uncertainties, but we can have confidence in Christ as we share him. The book of Isaiah, chapter 55, talks about the fact that the word of God will never return void. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. God uses people, and sometimes we don't see the results of what we've said, but God promises his word will never return void. And I do want to promise you that the word of God has power as it's proclaimed. 
Again, the writer of Hebrews chapter 10. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. It's not about you and your words. It's about the fact that God is dependable. God is trustworthy. Jesus Christ is faithful. God will do what he's promised. Jesus is faithful, and we can bank on him, and so we can preach the word of God. We can preach Jesus Christ with full conviction. We can hold fast to him who's faithful. And so he says, our words, well, it didn't come just merely words. Our actions match that. You need to realize it came in power and full conviction. I believe all those things were possible because the phrase I skipped. All those things are possible because Well, the Holy Spirit joins with us as we preach God's word. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts. God can use use people because the Holy Spirit somehow joins with us, and the Holy Spirit is the source of power. See, the apostles preached in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Thessalonians were changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we realize that somehow God, as we become his ambassadors, somehow as we preach God's word faithfully, as we share Christ, the Holy Spirit uses that to convict people. It's interesting. In fact, I love another passage in 1 Thessalonians, which tells us, well, it tells us even about the inspiration of Scripture in a sense. You might add this to how how do we know the the Word of God is dependable. Notice what Paul's going to say in the second chapter. And we thank God constantly for this, that when you received the Word of God, while you heard it from us, you accepted it not as the Word of men, but for what it really is, the Word of God Notice the next line, which is at work in you believers. You see, when the gospel is preached faithfully, when you share Christ faithfully, God can use that, and the Holy Spirit is in work in that, and so it's not just you. The Holy Spirit joins with you as you share the word of God. And I want to suggest, again, the word of God preached is the most powerful thing in the world. The word of God preached is faithful. It changes hearts and minds. The word of God preached is effective. The word is preached and effective because the Holy Spirit comes and joins with us. It joins with the preaching and the sharing of the Word of God with the preachers and the hearers, and that's the nature of the gospel. And so let me just say, the gospel going forward, it's our responsibility. You don't have to be eloquent. You just need to be faithful and have an abiding passion for the truth of God's Word. And as you share it, even as you share it, well, you might share it inadequately. Somehow God joins with us to help us in, the, in spreading the gospel message. And so we see the preaching of the gospel. Then I get even more excited. That, that's powerful, but I get more excited as we see not just the preaching of the gospel, but the reception of the gospel. And he goes on in this verse six, and he says, for you received the word. And then he's gonna list how they received the word. So I wanna stop again and ask the question, okay, how did they receive it? And it's interesting what happens. You see, they received the word of God not only for what it was, God's word, but notice how they received it, what it looked like, and we first learned they received it in much affliction. They received the word of God in turmoil. It was hard. Now, not only had Paul and Silas been driven out of Philippi and they came to Thessalonica, but the Thessalonians also were persecuted. In fact, we realize that right away that, that Jason is arrested and put in jail, and Paul and Silas are going to be driven out of Thessalonica, but the people there in Thessalonica, they continue to be ridiculed and persecuted. By the way, that word, in much affliction, its literal translation is in great tribulation, and there are people that always talk about, oh, the great tribulation. Paul actually says to them, you receive the gospel in the great tribulation. John, later in the book of Revelation, is going to say, I, John, a partner in the great tribulation. Where does the great tribulation happen? Well, it's here on earth. What's the great tribulation? It's people being persecuted for their faith. Now, that might get stronger and stronger, but I want to tell you, in parts of the world, there is great tribulation for being a Christian, isn't there? And we realize that these people in Thessalonica, they were under that. They were being persecuted. Again, Jason was put in jail. People were beaten. There are people that when they became Christians, they lost family and friends. Not that they turned their back on their family and friends, but their their family turned their back on them. There are people that lost jobs. There are people that endured hardship because of their faith. And so in the first century, when people chose Christ, it might mean ostracization. Did I say that right? I speak for a living. It meant hardship. It meant tribulation. Accepting Christ meant difficulty. Now, there's a whole bunch of false doctrine that goes on today that if you accept Jesus, everything's going to be smooth and hunky-dory. I want to tell you, wherever the gospel message goes forward, it will be persecuted. There are people who take a stand against the gospel message of Jesus Christ. You know that to be true, don't you? Realize, these Thessalonians, they accepted Jesus Christ even though it meant difficulty. In great tribulation, they received the word of God. But what's interesting, he goes on, not only did they receive the word of God, 
God in much tribulation or much hardship or affliction, they received it with joy. Just think about that for a second. With joy of the Holy Spirit. They're being persecuted for their faith, and yet they're still joyous. They realize what they have in Christ Jesus. We've got this misunderstanding that God wants to provide for us. His ultimate goal is that we'll be happy. And I've got to stop and say, no, his ultimate goal for you is that you'll be holy. That you'll become like Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I just said there? His goal is not to be some genie to grant your every wish. What he wants to do is conform you to the image of his son. But also notice these people, although they're being persecuted, they're receiving Jesus Christ with joy. And I've got to stop and say, joy is not the absence of suffering. Joy is actually the ability to, to have this firm, faithful resolve even in the midst of suffering. It's a realization that we've got something better than this. We're not meant for this world. It's only temporary. But as we're molded and shaped into the character of Jesus Christ, we should be joyful of the fact that we are becoming more like him and sharing in his sufferings. But more than that, we've got this day awaiting. We've got the return of Jesus Christ where he will come and all of our sorrow and hardship will pale in comparison to knowing this one thing our Lord and Savior Jesus. And so you need to realize that they received it with joy, not the absence of suffering, but joy amidst suffering, a calm assurance, a hopeful assurance, a trusting in Jesus Christ that he'll do what's right. They received it in much affliction and received it with joy in the Holy Spirit. And I want you to notice what happens. They become imitators and examples. Now, look at those two words. I put the Greek words up there. You know, I like the Greek words, but you'll recognize them. See that word imitator? See the word example? It's where we get our word mimic. It's also where we get our word type. Now, not false pretenses. It's not like a, a, a shoddy knockoff of the real thing. These words actually are not fake imitations. They're putting into practice what they had seen in the apostles. And so the apostles came, and by the way, the apostles came in much affliction and hardship, and they preached the word of God. And they share the joy of being in Christ. And as they do that, the people accept it. They receive it. And they start doing the same thing. They become witnesses for Jesus Christ. They become, well, they mimic. They imitate the apostles. What the apostles were doing, they were doing. So we realize they start following example, exactly what the apostles were doing. Well, what were the apostles doing? They were sharing Christ. In fact, Paul's going to say, brothers, join in imitating me. Or again later, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. It's this joint effort. I want to stop and say something here. In your life, you need godly examples. You're not meant to be doing life alone, and so you need to find somebody that's maybe ahead of you in Christ. You need to find somebody who's living out their faith, and you need to join with them. You need people like the Thessalonians had Paul to say, that's what it looks like. I'm going to strive to follow them. And in the same way, you might need to be somebody else's example, and you should be willing to say to somebody who does not yet know Christ, you come follow Jesus with me. You follow me as I follow Christ. And I want to tell you, we're supposed to be doing life together. You need somebody ahead of you. You need somebody behind you. But we've got to do this together. And we need people who are living, living out their faith actively and proclaiming their faith. That's what it looks like to become a disciple of Christ. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So let me put feet on this. Who is it that you are following because they're ahead of you and they're faithfully following Christ? You need to be doing life with them. Who is it that you're bringing along and say, look, I know I'm just beginning this journey, but I need somebody to follow with me. And that's what these people did. They became imitators and examples, which really leads to the next description of the reception of the gospel. And I love this. They sounded forth the gospel. They sounded forth the gospel. And again, I want you to look at that word. And the word of the Lord sounded forth from you. You see the word there? It has the word echo in it. It's a compound word, actually. The, word, the, the prefix ex means forth or, or, or from. And then this word sounded out. The gospel message, they had heard the gospel message and they start repeating it. They start sounding forth the gospel message, literally to sound out the gospel message. And so they'd heard the apostles speak and they simply turned around and say, can I tell you what I've heard? I wanna share with you the good news of Jesus Christ and this church, they received the gospel and they sounded forth the gospel as they became imitators of the apostles. And I'm just wondering, what would it be like if Eagle Christian Church was sounding forth the gospel message to those people who did not yet know it? You see, this passage talks about the preaching of the gospel and the reception of the gospel and the people becoming imitators of the gospel and of Paul and sounding forth the message. And that's why Paul could write, I'm so thankful for you. Verse 3, remember that? 
Every time I pray for you, I thank God for you, remembering your work of faith and your labor of love and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. This group had been changed by Christ. They'd received Jesus, but they weren't content just to sit and to soak. They started sounding forth the message, the gospel message of Jesus Christ, which really leads us to this full circle of what a disciple looks like. And we're going to see the results of the gospel as we get to the end of the chapter. Paul says to them, having turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They had not just received the gospel and they hadn't just started talking about the gospel. They were changed people. Their lives also reflected the gospel message of Jesus Christ in them. They turned, and I want you to notice the repentance in their life was evident. And actually four ways in our passage we're gonna see that it was evident in them. First of all, that word turned. It does mean to turn back. It's a word that's often translated repentance, and you need to understand what repentance is. Repentance is doing a U-turn. It's turning around. Before Christ, we were living for ourselves and our own goals and our own desires. We're doing things, well, for us. And repentance is, well, it's changing who we're living for. It's doing a U-turn. It's doing it about face. And rather than living for ourselves, we're going to live for Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We're going to do a U-turn and start living our life on purpose for God. And that's what these people did. They changed completely. And notice how they changed. Well, they changed. They, they turned back, their back on idols. That's repentance. A change of heart. A change of lifestyle. Now, their idols and their culture... Their whole culture was centered around the worship of these things. And some of them were sexual in nature. And some of them were monetary in nature. Some of them were, and they just turned their back on, well, their culture. And I'm going to suggest to you that's what's needed. We need Christians who will stand up and say, we're going to be different from the world in which we live. The goals and the idols of our culture, they're no longer our goals and our idols. And we're going to do life differently. That's repentance. That's a change of heart. They no longer look like the world. They no longer worship the things of the world And instead, notice the second thing they did. They actually gave their lives in service to Christ. That word service, it literally is the word slave. They gave their lives in faithful service. They said, Jesus, you are our Lord. You're our master. You're in charge. I want to tell you that, again, is true repentance, isn't it? Say, I'm not living for myself any longer. I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. He's in charge of me. He's in charge of every part of me. He is my Lord and Savior. They gave their lives in service to God. And then I love this last, uh, this, this last phrase in our, our, our chapter here. They, they eagerly awaited. They eagerly awaited the coming of Christ. Now, I've got to stop and I've got to talk about that word eagerly awaited again. It's, it's a rare one. You know I love rare words. It's the only time used in Scripture. It's also a combination of two words, meno, on a meno. Meno is the word waiting. Anna there in this sense, it's a word that that says waiting with remembrance. Or even stronger than that, waiting expectantly. They eagerly awaited the coming of Christ. They couldn't wait. In fact, that's part of the reason why Paul writes to them. They're saying, Paul, Paul, I thought you said Jesus was coming again. Why hasn't he come back yet? And Paul writes, says, look, God's faithful. He will come back. It just hasn't ha- happened yet. But these people are anticipatorily waiting for Jesus Christ. They can't wait. They can't wait to see Jesus face to face. They're going through all kinds of hardships and say, why are we having to go through this? They've had people in their congregation who have died, and they're wondering what's happened to them. They've got all kinds of hardship and trials and persecution, and they're saying, Lord, come quickly. And Paul promises them, look, I know what you believe and who you believe, and I promise that Jesus Christ is faithful. And these people were eagerly awaiting the coming of Christ when they'd be reunited with their family and friends and loved ones. When they would, well, they'd experience a time that wasn't full of hardship and pain and suffering and death. And maybe we need to join with the Thessalonians saying another word, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. He says, and to wait, from, wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This anticipatory waiting for Jesus Christ. I want to tell you, when that day happens, it will be worth it. And so we see the repentance, turning to God and turning away from idols and giving their lives in service to God and eagerly awaiting the coming of Christ. We see in their lives this word. They became disciples of Jesus. That's what a disciple is. It's a doing learner. It's not only being changed by Christ, but buying into the mission of Christ and proclaiming the good news of Christ. That's what a disciple is. And I want to tell you, that's what it means to be a true follower of Jesus. To be completely changed, to buy into the mission of Jesus and say, 
I'm not going to be the same any longer. I'm going to turn my back on the former way of life, and I'm going to buy into Jesus Christ and what he's done for me. I'm going to long for him and wait for him and eagerly share the message of Jesus Christ. I'm going to become one who echoes forth the gospel, and I'm going to suggest to you that's at the heart of what Paul's saying. I know. I know you're chosen by him and loved by him. Do you know why I know? Because you received the word of God for what it is, and you echoed forth the word of God. And I understand that you have become living examples, imitators not only of me, but of the Lord. And so he's able to say to them, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you, but your faith has gone forth everywhere. And he says from, Ach- uh, from Macedonia to Achaia to the ends of the world. Let, the world. Let me just say it this way. Macedonia, that's Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. The people there didn't just know about your faith, but also Achaia. Remember, Paul has gone down to, to Athens and then on to Corinth. Even those people have known about you and your faith. And then he says, and even to the ends of the earth. So here was a people group who had bought in completely. They'd heard the gospel message and received the gospel message and were echoing the gospel message. It had changed them. And because of that, the entire world, as they knew it, well, they'd heard about Jesus Christ. I just want to stop and say, what if that was true of us? What if we became this people that lived out our faith? Our actions matched our words. And we were people willing to share our faith, that our words were, well, they're words of Jesus Christ, what God promises will not come back void. And what if people knew about us, and when they heard about us, they knew the gospel message was true because they'd seen it change us? What, what if Eagle Christian Church had the reputation of, we know about those people. Those people are on fire for Jesus Christ, and they're echoing the gospel. And that's my prayer. And my challenge to you is, would you join with me? Join with me, being the kind of church that says, we are going to take a stand for the gospel message of Jesus Christ, and it will echo forth from us. Would you, would you pray with me? Father, I want to come before you. Father, help us be like this church in Thessalonica, that even in hardship, they took a stand for Christ. That even, even through great tribulation, they did not bow, they did not bend, that they were willing to share their faith and be examples to others of the gospel message of Jesus. And Father, my prayer is that that would be true of us. Father, take us and mold us and change us and shape us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us demonstrate to the world that we are loved by God and we share the message that they also are loved by God. And that's my prayer. pray this in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.